right, we'll turn in your Bibles to Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8, as I was preparing this, I, I thought I was going to get through the first four verses, but no, we're going to be concentrating just on the first verse of Romans 8. This is really, uh, consult any commentary, uh, most most writers and theologians would say that this this really is a pinnacle of of Paul's argument here in Romans chapter eight. As you're turning, let me just reflect. As as many as seek to take the words of the Bible and make them palatable for the surrounding culture and society, almost to soften their impact, whether by emphasizing one section over against another, or by conveniently editing out those phrases that rub modern people the wrong way. It happens all the time. Fact is that there's just no doubt that God takes the matter of his means of salvation more seriously and with more rigor than we can begin to imagine. Years ago, I, uh, I had agreed to participate in a local Christian music fest. I may have shared this before, but just bear with me. As a counselor in the prayer tent and... Um, don't ask. Well, that's later. <laughs> but this is where, after a heartfelt plea was made from the stage, the kids would go to be prayed for and talked with. I'd heard that this band that they uh, had as their headliner uh, was the headliner precisely because they were so gospel-centered. So the speaker, who was one of the guitarists in the band, made impassioned gestures about hurts and pain and trauma, all kinds of things common to young people, as we see hurts and pains and trauma. That's the very young. I don't, I don't think she's allowed to go to those kind of concerts at her age. <laughs> <coughs> and this young man guaranteed that Jesus was the answer to their problems. It was like, and I was thinking about this, it was like he was giving the refrain of the old hymn, Only Trust Him. We're all familiar with that. I think we might have sung it once or twice. Only trust him, only trust him, only trust him now. He will save you, he will save you, he will save you now. That's the chorus. And that is true, only Jesus can save you. But, and this really concerned me, something was painfully obvious in the entire presentation. There's a, there's a verse to that hymn. The very first verse is, come every soul by sin oppressed. There's mercy with the Lord. My friends, there was not one single solitary mention of sin in that entire presentation. I was paying attention. I wasn't trying to be judgmental, trying, not trying to be the fight and fundy, got to preach about hell, you know, wasn't that at all. I was thinking, okay, let's, let's see if he actually presents the gospel. Not one mention of sin, let alone repentance from sin, was ever mentioned in that entire gospel proclamation. Everything was positioned as coming from outside of a person, if you, if you have issues, it's because other people have affected you in deep and profound ways. Is that, is that a reality? Yes, people can sin and sin against you, and yes, that can, that can happen. But the whole thing was, was positioned as, it's, it's not you that could ever be the problem. Condemned? Me? No, God loves me and he just wants to help me out. It's my parents that are the problem. <laughs> well, we've been laboring along the past few weeks in Romans 7 with some stark truths. The reality is, for every Christian, while we seek to obey God and glorify him and his law word, we still have remaining with us that constant corrupting companion of the flesh, of the sin nature, and we've been freed from the power of sin, but not from the presence of sin. And we dare not go back to the law, which condemns, but we must flee to Jesus. We need to lean on Christ. You remember in, in chapter 7 how 
Sin is actually inflamed by that same law. Sin co-ops the law for its own purposes and for its own abandonment, advancement. Now, we must, we must remember Christ and rely upon our union with Jesus in order to gain victories over sin. Paul now gives us this pathway to this kind of a turning of the corner, this life in the Spirit and all the law demands of the believing sinner has been answered and met in Jesus Christ. And to the sinner, therefore, there is no condemnation. Let's flesh that out. Our passage this morning, Romans 8, verses 1 through 4. Hear the word of the Lord. Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. For the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set you free from the law of sin and of death. For what the law could not do, weak as it was through the flesh, God did, sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh and as an offering for sin. He condemned sin in the flesh so that the requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. This is the word of the Lord. So throughout this chapter, Paul is continuing his defense and explanation of the gospel as being a matter of faith righteousness in contrast to it being a matter of works or of the law. But it's much more than that. It's sort of a summing up of everything he's been teaching so far. Chapter 8 depicts the nature of our deliverance from the power of sin that we were just exposed to in chapter 7, which was hinted at in 7.6. If you look Look back a few verses, Romans 7, verse 6. But now we have been released from the law, having died to that by which we were bound, so that we serve in newness of the spirit and not in oldness of the letter. So I think he's picking up here. In fact, up until now, the indwelling spirit has only been mentioned four times in the book of Romans. And yet here in chapter 8, the Greek word for spirit is referred to a whopping 21 times. So I think, I think God is telling us something with that. This is an example of Paul building his argument again, giving us this fuller and maybe more, we could say, crowning aspect of our salvation by way of life in the spirit. The Christian is a new creation indwelt by the Holy Spirit of God. And as where in chapter 7, it seemed to be dark in a way, like a dark night with clouds and no stars. Wretched man, remember. Now Paul draws a line under that wretchedness and continues to point us in the direction that we need to walk, how we can walk in true holiness, and it is indeed by the Spirit. So I have three heads, very simple Kind of an outline from the verse, uh, verse 1 itself. Therefore, no condemnation in Christ. So, um, it's the old joke. Caden, can you tell me? Whenever we see a therefore, we have to ask. Oh, come on. That's right. Thank you, Caden. You, you were just waiting. You saw the therefore. You're sitting, I can't wait. He's going to ask me. He's going to ask me. I'm going to be ready. It's like when the guy says, so how old are you? Uh, oh, you thought about it. You didn't even think about it. You were right there. Thank you, Caden. Therefore, we're going to ask the question, so what is, what is Paul concluding here? I think the most immediate reference would be to chapter 7, verse 25. Thanks be to God through Christ Jesus our Lord. Therefore, that's really close, I mean, in proximity, and that's true as far as it goes. Maybe he's concluding that thought from verse, uh, chapter 7, verse 6, where he says, Now having been released from the law, having died to that which we were bound, we serve in newness of the Spirit. There's sort of a parallel there, too. The, the word now is important. Where now no condemnation exists, and now, back in 7, 6, we've been released from the law, in, in Romans 7, 6, that liberation from sin's mastery is a current reality. It's now and is itself a work of the Spirit, 
And here in chapter 8, verse 1, that reality has broken in no condemnation by virtue of Christ, his new life, and our union with him. In other words, we are not under condemnation because we have been set free from the law's tyranny and are no longer under sin's dominion. That, that could be it too. Maybe that's what Paul is using the therefore to point therefore. I also think, though, that Paul could be summing up what he began way back in chapter 6, where in chapter 6, verses 3 through 11, he magnifies the critical nature of our union with Christ. Remember those sermons where I kept saying, this is, this is so critical to Paul, in Christ, in Christ. Our union with Jesus in his death and resurrection. Remember all of those phrases that we read back in chapter 6. I'll just read them. They're kind of a catena of passages here. <clears throat> Baptized into Christ Jesus, buried with him, united with him, crucified with him, died with Christ, alive to God in Christ Jesus, all speaking with one voice regarding our precious union with the Lord Jesus Christ. So yes, Paul, by the inspiration of the Spirit, I believe is summing up what he's been saying this whole time and is heaping even more blessing upon us, therefore. So that's our first point. That was quick, pretty easy. Now, no condemnation. As we turn the corner, we're immediately confronted with language that would be suited to a courtroom. In the Greek, the first word isn't therefore. The first word is no. You know how we take, we take the Greek language and, and, uh, and position it so it's a little more understandable to our English-speaking ears. But the first word is no. It's this absolute negation. No condemnation, therefore, for those in Christ Jesus. It's like there's this divine gavel that has been brought down with power and authority. And God declares, not guilty, not condemned. The prisoner can go free. The, the death sentence is lifted. There exists no penalty that the prisoner must pay. There's no adverse sentence of death. It's, it's kind of exhilarating to think about. No, no condemnation. Therefore, there's no condemnation. But we, it's not just a judicial declaration either. It's that, but it's not just that. Remember, Paul has just been telling us back in chapter 7 about the presence of sin and we're not under sin's mastery. So I think this is more than just saying, here's, here's how we go back to that uh, judicial declaration of justified by faith alone. This is how you walk this out. It's that uh, tying together of justification with sanctification, practical holiness. Here's how you walk so you're not under sin's mastery. So I'll just say that at the outset. I think this, this judicial language, yes, indeed, absolutely declared righteous. Let's, let's not confuse the two, justification and sanctification. But in this sense, yes, it's, de it's declaratory. You're not condemned but he's going to be telling us how we can walk about in that freedom. You know, where back in Romans 5.18, we read, so then as through one transgression, transgression there resulted in condemnation to all men. We now see that that condemnation has been absorbed and turned away from us. That's propitiation, atonement. for those in Christ, by our Lord Jesus. And I want to take just a second here to talk about why this is critically important, because a lot, a lot of you weren't here a few months ago. When we're talking about the gospel and righteousness and justification, there's, there's this series of, of words in there that have similar but distinct meanings, and it, it really goes to the righteousness, the gospel of God, the justification of God. 
And it's critical. If there's, if there's no justice, ultimately, then there's no peace. I mean, the, the, the crowds are right to say no justice, no peace. Right. But by what standard? Back in Romans 3, there's that famous phrase that God set forth his son as a propitiation for all those who believe so that he would be just and the justifier of them who has, of one who has faith in Jesus. See, God sent his son into the world to defeat the enemy of mankind, the devil, and to free his people, to save his people from their bondage to sin and death. And what is really revealed all through the book of Romans is this righteousness of God that is not intrinsic to us. It is what Martin Luther called an alien righteousness. It comes from outside. See, that's, that's where these modern sermons get it backwards. The, the sin and trouble isn't from outside. That comes from in here. That's why we need saved. We need rescued from this body of death. The gospel comes from outside of us. It's the Lord Jesus Christ and his righteousness. And remember that the righteousness or justice of God is that essential property of God's nature where he renders to himself and to all of his creatures that which is right and equal. And it is evident that God is just, he is righteous. I believe the most simple sense in the context of our salvation that Paul's talking about, again, God's righteousness, his justice and his holiness with utterly no derivation, no change, no shadow of darkness whatsoever. And for believers, it is to be made righteous in the sight of God. By, by that I mean when God can look at you, again, be honest, go back two weeks, how many of you are still struggling in sin, and yet the attitude is different than it was before. You're not walking after the flesh, you're having to deal with the flesh, it's a different thing. To be declared righteous by the imputation of the righteousness of Christ. So Paul had just spent the last part of chapter 7 reminding us that if we remain beholden to the law without the Spirit, if we are walking after the flesh, we will utterly fail and it will be disastrous. But praise God, Christ and the power of his resurrection has actually broken into your life and mine broken into the world, and that same power that raised Jesus from the dead is at work in your life and mine, and he is the guarantee of our future salvation in all of its fullness. See, that's part of what we are talking about when we say, already, not yet. Every, every Christian has to think about these. There's something that's already, and yet, not yet, and yet, not yet. Just like in Romans 5, 9, much more than having now been justified by his blood, we shall be saved from the wrath of God through him. See, even in that verse, having been justified now, there's a future fulfillment of that being saved from God's wrath. Thomas Matton, which by the way is in your, your bulletin, I, I found this old Puritan. Thomas Manton wrote of this concept of condemnation where sinful man cannot meet the bar of God's justice and righteousness. He said this, the terror of it is unspeakable when it is sufficiently understood and therefore by consequence our exemption and deliverance from it is the greater mercy. In other words, you don't truly understand God's patience and grace and mercy until you understand the terrors of condemnation. Condemnation, cat, catachridma. <laughs> I'm not going to try to pronounce that again. It's, it's the Greek word. It's really the damning sentence, though, of God's wrath. Condemnation, as it is rightly understood, is the backdrop that allows the believer to bathe in the glory of the statement of its negation. 
There's no condemnation. Again, this is almost a, uh, a riff off of that, that famous uh, open-air preacher, uh, Hell's Best Kept Secret. What's his name? Um, yeah, anyway. Yeah. Ray Comfort. That's right. He goes, how, how can you understand salvation when you don't understand what you need to be saved from? Uh, so true. You know, John the Baptist in, in John three thirty six said this, He who believes in the Son has eternal life, but he who does not obey the Son will not see life, and the wrath of God abides on him. That's condemnation. That's where God's wrath continues on the guilty sinner. A Christian is a person who at one time stood condemned in your sin. A non-Christian is a person who currently stands condemned in their sin. And again, I know this sounds like, you know, you're, you're emphasizing this negative aspect, but think with me here. If there's no original condemnation of sin, going back to Adam, yes, but, but in reality, to Adam and all his offspring, there would be no need for a savior, would there? I mean, now we're talking about something different than being saved from the wrath of God. How did Paul begin his entire letter to Romans? For the wrath of God is revealed against wickedness. It's not, an, it's not a sidebar, you know. And think about that young Christian rock presenter of something. I can't see how the concept of no condemnation makes a lick of sense in the context of that kind of message. It's just not there. How could, how could anyone rejoice and glory in the fact that there's now no condemnation when well, there was no condemnation in the first place? Not really. I know it's kind of silly, but the, the point is still there. It affects everything. It affects literally every aspect of your Christian life. There's a temptation also for some folks to read passages like this in an almost universalist way. How many of you have been to, a, let's say, a funeral of someone and the guy doing the funeral basically preached a doctrine of justification by death and we're all, you know, let's all... What, I remember one time we were at a funeral for a guy I know was a just horrible sinner, never repentant. And uh, out of the blue, the guy said, well, let's all pray the Lord's Prayer. And I looked around and there were there were people who, I'm not praying the Lord's Prayer. At least they understood, okay, it's not all, it's not just, you know, automatic, everyone's in. Because really, when you think about it, the, the modern view of God is that he reflects our own social uh, mores. There's no condemnation because there's no condemnation. My God would never condemn anyone. As with the recent interview that NBC did with Doug Wilson, he can sit and explicitly say what the Bible explicitly teaches about man and woman, children. And then they're going to bring in a Unitarian woman pastor who starts gainsaying everything he said because it doesn't quite jibe with her version of things, which her version of things conveniently sound just like what everyone in the pagan world is saying anyway. It's primarily she doesn't believe. By the way, Christianity is Trinitarian, so that, that should have been a clue right there. But we should always begin thinking in terms of the good news as it relates to the bad news. The love of God is poured out on the cross, but that place of pain and suffering is one upon which its victim, the Lord Jesus, bore in his body all of the wrath of God against all of the, un, of the godlessness and unrighteousness of all of his people. Good news about salvation without context is almost meaningless. It's, it's, it's not anything at all. So what is meant by no condemnation, we can even help clarify this, I think, by defining what Paul doesn't mean by no condemnation. 
you know, some people <clears throat> try to accuse other Christians of saying, well, you just got it all together and you're just, you're perfect, you're self-righteous. And I'm like, you don't, you don't know me, you don't know anything, you know. Paul doesn't say there's no accusation against them. There is. There's no question about it. We have sinned. And the accuser of the brother and the devil would be right in bringing up our record. But the difference is that the sentence no longer stands against us. We've been declared not guilty and not under sin's mastery. Paul doesn't say there's nothing in him that doesn't deserve condemnation. Let's get real. Do, do you deserve God's condemnation? Well, yeah. Born in sin, steeped in it. I have a past. <laughs> Somebody says, history is usually a good thing, but if someone says, that person's got a history, that's not a good thing. <laughs> Because in reality, there is that which should draw down upon us God's displeasure. The difference is that we see it, Christian, you see it, you know it, you own it, and you mourn over it. And sometimes you even condemn yourself for it, but not final condemnation. Paul doesn't say, there's no cross, there's no affliction, there's no discipline of the Lord. Well, of course there is. This is what was promised to us in our discipleship. Did you know what you were getting when you signed up for, I will follow Jesus? What does Paul say? You're going to suffer persecution. You're going to be tried and tested in the crucible of God's furnace. Right. How many of us have achieved anything great in life by ease and leisure? No, it's, it's, it's by, by pushing forward and straining and, and, and overcoming failures, you know. Hebrews 12, 9 through 10 says, Furthermore, we had earthly fathers to discipline us, and we respected them. You can talk to my son Aaron about that. He, he'll tell you. Shall we not much rather be subject to the Father of spirits and live? For they disciplined, speaking of earthly fathers, they disciplined us for a short time has seemed best to them, but he disciplines us for our good that we may share in his holiness. Really, if you're a Christian, you're going to be disciplined by God. The, 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 the brush of your life is going to be trimmed by the Lord. It's going to be pruned so that the dead wood is, is out of the way and so you can bring forth more life. But that's not condemnation. That's not the condemnation. See, there was condemnation. There was therefore a time where there was condemnation. That was the, the real state of affairs for everyone. But now, therefore now, it has been removed. That critical little word now, it's, it's immediate. It's like it's saying, Henceforth, from this time forward, it's like a royal and regal announcement. Now there is, it's, it's the most emphatic negative word you can find in the Greek language, udais, no condemnation. Not even the tiniest smidgen of condemnation for those who have been united to Jesus Christ by faith. I, uh, I, I must confess that I, most powerfully resisted temptation on my vacation. Uh, we were on the pier at Oceanside, and there at the beginning of the pier was a placard of Jehovah's Witness literature. And I thought, you know, I can either engage with these people or enjoy the rest of the day with my wife and daughter and son-in-law. So I, it's one of the few times I didn't just go right up and say, hey, man. <laughs> But there were some Jehovah's Witnesses at the pier. Here's the thing. They, they're, they're, they may have a little bit or a whole bunch of ongoing standing condemnation under God. It all depends on them. 
It always depends on the work that they do for the Watchtower Bible and Tract Society. They're still under condemnation because they're not united to Jesus. They're in Newport, too. Say what? They're in Newport Beach, too. Yes, they are. They, they, are. they didn't look too happy to be there, I'll tell you that right now. Suit and tie, and it's summer. Any other, any other religious group, name them, go down the list. They stand condemned because they are not united to Jesus. Every system that exists depends on the sinner's performance. So Paul says, yes, the sense of having no condemnation is uniquely for a certain group, and that's our third point in Christ Jesus. In chapter 6, Paul taught us that our vital and living union with Christ was the ground of our life and existence and identity. Everything for the believer can be subsumed into, quote, union with Christ. That which is Christ's is yours. And that which is yours is Christ. Can you imagine? But that's true. That's now. The old Scottish pastor, Robert Haldane, wrote this, Everything which Christ has becomes the property of the believing soul. Everything which the soul has becomes the property of Christ. Christ possesses all blessings and eternal life. They are thenceforward the property of the soul. The soul has all its iniquities and sins. They become the property of Christ. And he goes on, the Christian is a king and consequently possesses all things. He is a priest and consequently possesses God and, is, and it is faith, not works, which brings him this honor. A Christian is free from all things, above all things, faith giving him richly all things. For those who are in Christ Jesus, that gavel has come down from the royal bench and declares with certainty no condemnation. We can trust God with this. We have to. Where else do we go? Back in John 6, Jesus said this, For I've come down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. Do you believe Jesus accomplishes the Father's will without error, without fault? Amen. And this is the will of him who sent me, that of all he has given me, I lose nothing but raise it up on the last day. Jesus never fails. He accomplishes all that he came to do. And it is impossible for anyone who is truly in Christ to ever be separated from him. That's later on in Romans 8. In fact, you could even say that it is just as impossible for you to be condemned as it is for Christ to be condemned. Can God the Father ever condemn God the Son? No, never. That's what it means to be in Christ. I love what the old Puritan commentator Matthew Henry wrote regarding this passage right here. He said this, they may be chastened of the Lord, that's discipline, but not condemned with the world. Now this arises from their being in Christ Jesus. By virtue of their union with him through faith, they are thus secured. They are in Christ Jesus as in their city of refuge and are so protected from the avenger of blood. He is their advocate and he brings them off. In other words, he carries it to its conclusion. There is therefore no condemnation because they are interested in the satisfaction that Christ made to the law. In Christ, God not only does not condemn them, but is well pleased with them. One guy recently, and I'll, I'll close with this, guy recently wrote me and said, There's, there are a lot of people like myself who subconsciously relate to God as a condemning judge. 
And then he went on to explain how certain very repetitive worship songs help him step out of that. And I wrote him back and I said, yeah, you're, you're right. God is a condemning judge for everyone outside of Christ. It's because God is holy. He's just. There's no question about it. The gospel is unnecessary if that's not true. And I was, I was trying to be kind. I said, listen, if you're, if you're in Christ, then this is most definitely not the case. And I said, what do you look for or what do you look to to be reminded of this fact? Is it, you know, this endless repetition of a line in a song or do you look to God's word? Therefore, there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. This is a now promise of God fulfilled in Jesus. And it's the reality, just as we read two weeks ago, the reality of the Christian life is you're going to have to struggle against sin. This reality is just as true and even more transformative. There's no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. I pray this is true of you this morning. You know, I, I mentioned earlier, people can sometimes condemn themselves for sin. You're not the judge, ultimately, God is. Paul even said, even if my conscience is clear, that's not enough, it's God who judges. And if God has laid that gavel down and called you not guilty, then you need to trust God with that. And as we walk through this chapter, this glorious chapter eight, learn what it means to walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. Be able to get a foothold in your life over those besetting sins and things that entangle your life. All right, let's pray. Lord, we thank you so much for the promises of your word. We thank you for the great salvation that was purchased for us 2,000 years ago on Calvary's tree. We thank you that in Christ, there is no more condemnation, no wrath stored up for us on the day of judgment. Lord, help us to glorify you in this and to glory in this fact that our lives would be shaped by this reality. We'll give you all the praise and we thank you in Christ's name. Amen.